All right, we're getting ready to get started. Folks still coming in this morning. I want to read you. I think you'll be blessed this morning. Okay, Miss Wendy, you're here. Be quiet. I want to read you uh, a note if we could. Uh, this is from one of our teenagers. And this was written to her school and she got to come to church. This is what it says. Please excuse me for not being in school on Friday, April 12th. Our church is having Jubilee service this week and it means the world to me to be there. It's not every day that we get to hear some of God's most powerful preachers preach about the Lord. As a young teen, church has kept me out of trouble, away from drugs and alcohol. I spend my weekends going to visit people and bike them to church so that they may come to know Jesus, their personal Savior. I also have a burden for my friends and classmates to know about Jesus and what He has done for me in my life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, that's a good permission slip. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand this morning, Brother James. Gonna go. How many of you glad to be in church? Say, Amen. Amen. I'm ready to have church. Are you? Praise God, I got up early this morning, sat down on the back deck. Birds were singing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. I heard some four-part harmony between a robin and a cardinal and two mockingbirds. Amen. They were singing good. And we're looking forward to a good day. Listen, if you preach this morning, brag on Jesus. Listen, my hair's not too long. My Bible's a King James. I do watch TV and I love the Master. She ain't going to help me there. Just preach the Word of God. Amen. And we'll have a good time. I promise you that. My shirt is purple. All right? And so just preach the Word of God. Amen. And we'll have a good time. If you don't, I'll jerk you down. Somebody else to preach. Amen. All right. Brother James, leave man, another bow tie. Man, i got to get me a bow tie. All right. Here we go. All right, we'll start with page 350. Page 350 down on the bottom. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses of this. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way. To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore On the second verse we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirit shall sorrow no more not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. On the last verse. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise. For the glorious gift of His love And the blessings that hallow our days Let's sing it out! In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Amen, amen. Aren't you glad it gets better farther on? Amen. Brother Jimmy, you might as well get over. I'll let you play a little bit and we just might sing. Then I'm going to turn you loose in a minute. Real quickly, I want Brother Stan Mitchell to come up here. He's going to tell you about a packet deal he's going to give every preacher that's here today. He's a pastor of People's Baptist Church, Corpus Christi, Texas. And now he's the director of the Roll-Off Homes. And uh, he's going to come up. And we're excited about getting to go out there next year and preach. My first time when I was a young man and in, in, uh, just starting out at Friendship years ago, 
I ride up and down the road and listening. Boy, that was years ago. <laughs> ride up and down the road and listen to Brother Roloff every morning on my way to Bible college. And uh, Brother Stan's doing a great job out there. They're renovating all the buildings and getting things going good out there. And we're going to go out there next year. Matter of fact, uh, we're going to do a motorcycle ride out there. We're going to ride 13, 1,400 miles. These two nut preachers right here are going to be going. And uh, if you ride and you like to go with us, now I know if that bothers you and you're too spiritual to ride a motorcycle, you, you don't have to go. You know, but uh, if you'd like to go, uh, we're going to do that. I'm going to actually send my suits out. Amen. Amen and uh, then I'm going to ride out and uh, just uh, look forward to it. Anyway, he's going to tell you a little bit about something he's going to give you in a little while. Tell him what's in that preacher. Amen. Want. I also want to invite you to our uh, meeting uh, this June. As a matter of fact, 23rd through the 27th, uh, we'll have Brother um, Hudson out with us. We also have Brother Charles Worley with us. And uh, any of you can come out during that week. We'd love to have you. We put folks up, preach men, amen, call preachers from the floor on Friday morning. Love to have you. But all the preachers here today, I'd love to give you a pack here. This is the homegoing service of uh, Brother Roloff. It's two uh, CDs. Great, great service, really is. He's been, uh, he's been in heaven now 30 years this year. I don't know if you knew that or not. And then a, a thing here called uh, Words Fitly Spoken. It's just sayings. If you knew Brother Roloff, he had a lot of good sayings, things of that nature. I want to give you that. And then what's helped me probably more to understand uh, the burden there where we're at. This is Lester Roloff in Life and in Death. Some of you probably read that, but we want to give that to you as well. And then a book he wrote also on soul, mind, and body. Uh, just see me after the service. Gentlemen, I've got my truck outside the box. The box is just full of stuff out there. I want to give to every preacher here and uh, pass that on to you to help you. Amen. Pray for the work out there. We're trying to rebuild do a lot. Thank you. you pray for us, start us out, All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of salvation, Lord. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a good night rest. And God, we know and realize, God, you're the one that gives us each and everything. Lord, we have, God, and we're honored, God, to be here in your presence this morning. God, I pray, Father, you'd help us, Lord, to clear our head, our mind, our eyes, our thoughts from all the world and things thereof. And, God, may we enter into this service, Lord, with you and you only on our hearts and mind. Lord, we do pray for the dear man of God and each and every man of God, Lord, that will stand up here this morning. God, we pray you'd give them power in the pulpit, God, and give them demonstration of the Holy Ghost. God, give us listening ears. And, God, may everything that's said and done in this service, Lord, please, God, may it bring glory and honor to the Lamb of God, Lord. We love you this morning. Thank you for loving us, teaching us how to love, Lord, and showing us how to love. I pray, God, you uh, just shed your love upon us this morning. Have your way, God, in everything said and done. We'll thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just remain standing this morning. We like to do something around Calvary now and then. We like to sing a song. All right, page 46. In this world I've tried most everything And I'm happy now to say There's nothing like religion In the good old fashioned way I'm walking on the old time highway And I want the world to know That I'd rather be an old time Christian Than anything I know I'd rather be an old time Christian than anything I know. There's nothing like an old time Christian with a Christian love to show. I'm walking in the grand old highway and I'm telling everywhere I go that I'd rather be an old time Christian than anything I know. All right, fellowship, find somebody you don't know, shake their hand, introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be saved? Yeah. It really is. Amen. I want uh, just a moment to tell you just uh, today that early this morning, um, God woke me up and I just want whatever God wants for us in the service. I knew you can't preach to everybody in a meeting and to be honest, I don't do friend things or none of that. I really just want what God put on my heart. So I got up early this morning, and I just sought the Lord. I said, God, who do you want to preach? What have they got that I need? And then I just waited on God to speak to my heart. And uh, one of them, I wasn't even sure was going to be here, but he's here today. But I want the first message, and be a 30-minute message here, uh, to come from the preacher that preached for us Wednesday night. And God burned my heart about him this morning. And I believe he's got a message we need. And I want Brother Mark Walters, pastor of Living Waters Baptist Church, to come preach our first message for us. 
uh, I appreciate this dear man of God. And uh, I appreciate what God's done in his life. And you'll never meet anybody that's a sweeter preacher. And I mean that. And uh, I want him to preach for us. And uh, he'll bring a first 30 minute message, and we have some more singing. I love you, preacher. Turn in your Bibles over to Genesis chapter 37. I thought Brother Chris was my friend. He asked me to come and preach for him Wednesday night after Brother Joe. And then he got me to preach first this morning after last night. What is he doing to me, brother? Well, I think the reason Jan called and was upset about the Internet was because she finally wanted to hear some good preaching, preacher. So uh, uh, it's good to be here. I enjoyed what the Lord has done for us this far this week. Let me say, Calvary, thank you for all the meals, the foods, the motel room, everything. I appreciate your burden and what you've done this week. And a lot of you do so many things behind the scene. I appreciate that. I, I think I could speak for all of us. You take great care of us, and I love you. I'm praying for you. And uh, I, I want to say this as I go into the message. This place is unique. I think I said that Wednesday night, but it is very unique. A lot of places you go, you don't have this liberty. You don't have this touch of God. You don't have people together like this. A lot of places you certainly don't have a pastor that cares as much for you and wants to see God do things for you in your life uh, at home, at school, at work, in church, and uh, don't, whatever you do, don't lose it. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Now, I'll tell you why, uh, not only for yourself, but I'll say this selfishly, so that we can come and be a part of the Jubilee. God give us some help. We can go back to our churches. Amen? So uh, the Lord's got you here for a reason, and uh, just hang in there. Stay at it. Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. Notice what the Bible said. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 year old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad with, with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilphah, his father's wife, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. I want to start there with these four verses and I'm going to wind up over in Genesis chapter 50. But uh, I, I want to say this as a way of introduction here. I'm glad, listen to me, I'm glad that I'm saved. I, I want to preach this morning on this thought, why Joseph should have failed. But, but I want to say this, I'm glad that I'm saved. I really am. I appreciate the fact God letting me uh, uh, show up here this week, get in the services. I like when God comes around, amen. I, I like when the Holy Spirit moves and stirs on us. Listen, I don't get that all the time. And, and uh, have you ever found yourself going to church? If not, you should. But going to church looking for God to show up, looking for God to do something. God, through the singing, through the preaching, whatever it is, uh, would you just show out? Would you just move uh, and do something for us? I've got to have it. And uh, as a child of God, I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm glad I can get around that. I'll say this. Listen to me. Listen. I enjoy living a Christian life. I do. I don't miss anything in the world. Nothing. I've wallowed in sin. I, I don't want to elaborate on that. But, honey, I've been uh, to the lowest depths in the world in the sin. And I don't regret leaving anything out there. We're going to ride motorcycles to a meeting in Houston or, or, or Corpus Christi. A uh, preacher said, I don't care if you like that or not, if you're not spiritual. Honey, if you ride motorcycles with us, you better be spiritual. I promise. If you don't know God when you leave, you'll know Him about halfway there. I promise you. If you fall in that dude on a, a motorcycle, you will know God. Well, at any rate, I don't miss anything in the world. I don't miss a thing in the world. Let me say this. I'm not upset at all this morning about the things in the Word of God that God has instructed me not to do. 
you get the world hung up on uh, I'd be a Christian but I don't want to do this I'd be a child of God but I don't want to I'd be uh, get saved but I, hey I'm not worried at all about what God told me not to do fact of the matter I'll say this I'm not worried at all about what God's told me to do I love it I love what God's done in my life I love living a Christian life I really do I'm enjoying myself compared to the mess I used to be in isn't it great? Well, sing that song again. I'd rather be an old-time Christian. I'd rather be an old-time Christian than anything I know. And now that we've all shouted time out just for a second. But I do have to confess, not everything's went my way since I've been saved. I've shouted and enjoyed God and raised my hands and cried and enjoyed preaching and praying and reading the Bible and everything, but I do have to admit it's not always went my way. I have looked at God and said, why before? I have cried at night and said, God, what are you doing? This absolutely makes no sense at all. God, I'm saved. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. But I don't understand what you're doing, God. This makes no sense at all. I've whined. I've belly ached. I've sucked my thumb. I've called your preacher. I've pouted in his lap. I've pitched fits. I've got mad. I've quit on God a million times. I don't know how many Mondays I've threw it in and said, forget it. And you a liar if you say you've never done that. There's been times I've misunderstood God and I've gotten bitter. Gotten bitter at God. This makes no sense. There's been times that I've looked at it, preacher, and I've said, God, I've been doing everything right and everybody else is doing everything wrong and we ain't growing and I ain't shouting and we ain't got no money. And the, You know what I'm talking about. And I've got to the point in time in my Christian life, I said, what is the point? And I have to confess to you, I've prayed God many times, I hope this ain't on the internet, don't record this. God, let me leave. Can I just go be a Walmart greeter? God, can I just hand somebody a buggy when they come in? Say, welcome to Walmart. And, and, and then when I clock out, I'm done. Don't call me on my cell phone. Don't whine. Don't bellyache. I don't want to hear from you. I'm nobody's pastor. I, I don't care if the whole world goes to hell. Welcome to Walmart. You know what I'm saying. But why is it you can't quit? Why is it God will not let you fail? I don't talk about Joseph. Joseph... If anybody had a reason to quit and fail, it was Joseph. If anybody had a reason to say forget it, it was Joseph. But I'll say this, he didn't. Now Joseph is 27 years old when he's in Egypt here. Been there about 10 years, about a third of his life. And uh, he had learned, no doubt, how the Egyptians worked. He had learned their mannerisms, their customs, uh, how they treated each other. You know, uh, when you're around somebody, you'll figure out what they're like. I never smoked a cigarette growing up until I got a job. And at that job, preacher, listen to this. At that job, I was in there working, and I'd work and work, and, and I know somebody else would get a cigarette and they'd go take a break. Yeah. That about a 30-minute break, and I'd look around, and I'd be the only idiot in there working. It wasn't long after that. I said, hey, give me one of them things. Let me have a drag. I found myself standing around there about 30 minutes. And it was nothing getting... It don't take you long to figure out people, does it? Joseph figured out what the Egyptians were like. And, uh, but there was something about Joseph uh, that he didn't begin to act like them. Listen to me. Why should Joseph have failed? Well, number one, I wrote this down. He comes from a dysfunctional family. Look at Abraham. Honey, Abraham, listen, I know God made him covenants. I know what God done through him. I've read the word of God, but he's crazy. <laughs> Let's be honest. God made him a promise. You're going to have a son. I'm going to bless all the world through him. But what did Abraham do? He said, well, God, I'll just help you do it. Sarah's old. Hey, God, I'll tell you what, dude. Sarah developed this plan. And I'm going to tell you what. Well, I'll move right on right there. I'm about to say something get me in trouble. 
But Abraham listened to Sarah. Made a mess out of things. Hey, honey, they're still fighting on the other side of the world uh, because of that decision. Uh, dysfunction at its best. But he was a child of God, wasn't he? What about Isaac, his grandfather, Esau, Jacob? Well, he got blind one day. And Mom said, I'll tell you what, I've heard Dad say that he's going to bless Esau. Esau sold his birthright. You know the story. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do, son. You go out and kill a goat. Uh, we'll take some of that hair and put it on your arm. Your dad's blind. He won't have no clue what's going on. Uh, well, it feels like Esau. I don't know if it smells like Well, I guess he brought me that savory meat that I wanted. Here's the blessing. Now, wait a second. Time if Mom done that. Mom done that. What a way to teach your boys how to grow up. Uh, what a way for dad to get everything totally wrong. He come from a dysfunctional heritage. Jacob, his father, he had children from four different women. The Bible said he loved Joseph, made him a coat of many color. There's all them boys looking around each other. Preacher, can you imagine what breakfast was like at Jacob's house? I mean, going out, they fighting, they screaming, they cussing, they hollering all the time at each other. Mad, well, hey, I'm dad's favorite. And, uh, well, I can't stand for shit. They fighting them boys, they beating each other to death all the time. Amen. Dysfunction at its best. Now, I'll say something here if I can that'll help you. Listen to me. We read the Word of God. We think everybody in there's got little wings on and halo and that they never done anything wrong, that everything was fine. Hey, honey, they were just like me and you. The human race is messed up. We're tainted by sin. Our heart is evil. We're constantly thinking, hey, I think enough send me to hell every day. I but thank God for His mercy. I'm talking about dysfunction. The family, nobody got along. They dug a hole through him in it. We're just going to kill him, tell God some wild animal. No, let's not do that. A bunch of Midianites come by. They sold him, took him down to Egypt, sold him again. Next thing you know, he's a slave working down in Egypt. How would you have felt if that had been you, if you'd been Joseph? Somewhere along the line, he'd heard about God. God, why in the world? And I've said this, and God, why was I born into the family I'm in? They're all crazy. But I've said this, God, why do you let me pastor such a church? They're all crazy. Ain't none of my members here, thank God. I can relax. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? You look around and you talk about dysfunction. I'm going to say something here. I don't hurt nobody's feeling. I love his church. I love your preacher. I love his family. I love everybody else. But Christians are crazy. You're exactly right, brother. I've got a colored shirt on. Does that mean I'm a womanizer? Where do we come up with some of the most stupid doctrine in the world? Where do we come up with such crazy stuff? I worry about how long your sideburns are. I, I'm not preaching against I'm just talking about how dumb it is. And the world looks in and looks at us and says, Is that all you got? We're not so far from the way Joseph. Well, I'll say this, chapter 30, or chapter 39, verse 20. He come from a dysfunctional family. He should have failed. But number two, the authority over him betrayed him. He got thrown down there in Egypt. God began to bless him. God began to touch him. They began to see something different in his life. Hey, preacher, you're right. God anointed him with oil, rubbed it all over him. He got down there in Egypt. His countenance was different. Everything about him was different. They saw what was going on, and they give him some authority. He began to work. And then here comes this old sorry gal. Devil brought her up just the right time, snatched his coat. And if you'll notice over here in chapter 39... Verse 17, she spake unto him according to the word, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. Well, that lying devil. But here's the I ain't worried about her. I ain't worried about her at all. She's just doing what she done, naturally. That's just her heart. But the problem about that is the very guy that saw the touch of God on his life, the very guy that put it, never gave him a chance. 
never gave him a chance. Verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king prisoners were bound, uh, and he was there, the Bible said, in the prison. Uh, all right, here we go. Why should he have failed? Number one, his family is dysfunctional. They threw him in a hole. They sold him off. Uh, he got down here. Now listen, this is the way it is. We come through a trial. God begins to bless and move, and you get back up on the mountaintop. And then the devil shows up. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, Monday morning next week, honey, it'll be on for some of you. You'll shout it out all week long. You'll take a breath Saturday. You'll come back and have a great day Sunday. Monday you'll go back to work, get back in the groove, uh, and everything will blow all the pieces. I've been in the pit. I've come from a dysfunctional family. Now I'm down here in prison. Potiphar never even gave me a chance to explain what happened. Never give me a chance saying what's going on. God, I quit. I, I can't live like this. Lord, I'm trying, but I cannot live like this, Lord. He should have failed because the authority over him betrayed him. Well, while he's in prison, he met some fellas. Uh, this is something dysfunctional about this king. I mean, he got mad at his butler and baker. The Bible said they offended in chapter 40, verse 1, their Lord, the king of Egypt. Well, Pharaoh was wroth, the Bible says, against two of his officers, against the chief of the butler and against the chief of the baker. Put them down there. And Joseph got in there. Remember, he's anointed with that oil. I don't care if you are in the pit or in prison. You can glow. You can shine. Got down there and God began to bless, got to shine. Got friends with those fellas, began to help them, tell them some things, preach to them, tell them something that would encourage them. They got out of prison. One of them did. The Bible said in verse 22, chapter 40, and he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Verse 23, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. The authority betrayed him. But not only that, he is forgotten by those he helped. Yeah, I want to say this to you, and I think every preacher in here will understand this. Don't it hurt when you cry and weep and preach and beg. I made fun of Double D all morning. I come out early this morning before we ate breakfast. He was out there in his truck studying. I said, I hope, I hope you have to preach, brother. I hope you do in front of everybody. Ha, ha, I hope you have to preach. I said, I'm going to sit there and get me an outline. I walk in, preach, answer me, Mike, you're preaching first. Immediately, I got that lower gut roll. Ugh. You know what I'm talking about, fellas? Oh, God, not me. Sweat begin to pop out. You're getting nervous. You're singing, I'd rather be an old-time Christian. I text Jan. She's at the housework, and I said, pray, pray, pray. i got to preach first. Behind these big guns. But when you have a burden, and you need to deliver it, and you preach, I want to say this to you. If you never preached, we ought to have a Sunday when we let other people try. You'll shut your mouth talking about the preacher. You'll quit making fun of him and his family. Oh, he don't never work about two or three times a week. You get up here and give it a whirl for about 30 minutes and see how you feel. I'll tear you up. You have that burden. You pray, you beg, you study, you pr preach, and you, you weep, and you, uh, you neglect your family. You chase people all over the place. Hey, preaching, pastors, not eight to five. Evangelism's not eight to five. You never clock out. And then watch people blame you for everything that's going wrong in their lives. Blame God for everything that's going on. And at the time they ought to be on the altar begging God to help them, they pull up their stakes and leave. Joseph should have failed dysfunction. Authority betrayed him. He was forgotten by all those people that he helped. They got out, left him down there. Hey, you know, any psychologist would have looked at Joseph and said, you're going to have a hard time in life, boy. You are, I'm telling you, let's get you on every Prozac and uh, 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 whatever Xanax and everything else. Uh, and listen, I ain't making fun of those. If I'd have had a handful, I'd have took them 30 minutes ago. But uh, all of those things, we're going to hook you on these and uh, we'll get you, yeah, because you'll never make it. He'd had plenty of reasons not to trust people. 
plenty of reasons. He'd have never been a good daddy. Nobody ever taught him how to be a good daddy. Had twins, had kids, therefore he'd loved one better than the other, betrayed one. I, he'd, he'd have never known how a mom, none of his grandparents, great-grandparents, nobody ever taught him anything on how to have the right kind of family. That had been like most average Baptists, if I say. They come to church, that's about it. They fight like hell on the way. They do on the way back. And Monday through Saturday, they never read their Bible. I mean, really. That's, that's the way they lived. Joseph, you'd never, you're never going to be anything. Why, he'd have learned to cheat. I would have never hired Joseph if he'd have come to apply for a job. Why, he'd watch the Egyptians down there. He'd watch these two guys. Whatever I've got to do, I'm going to exalt me. That's what he'd been taught. He had every reason in the world to be bitter. He had every reason in the world to quit and fail. But I'm going to tell you this. Got a couple other points and I'm done. He didn't. Thank God for the end of the story. He didn't. Why didn't he fail? Well, I write this in the front of your Bible. I, just, I don't claim ownership to this. I read it. Somebody else, I don't know who wrote it, but I, we are not born winners or losers. We are born choosers. You don't, you're not born a winner? I'm from the great family. I'm going to make it. No, honey, you're born a chooser. Chooser. Joseph chose not to fail. Joseph chose. Why? Three little points, I'm done. Number one, he chose to believe the promise of God rather than what he saw going on around him. You remember in chapter 37, verse 5 to 11 there, got up, went down to breakfast table. God, I had a dream last night, fellas. God told me, you boys going to bow down to me. Now, I want to say something here to you. I remember when I answered a call to preach. 1987. I went home that night. Mom and dad were sitting in the living room. Now, my dad was lost. My brother's still alive. My young brother's still alive. And dad was lost. I walked in there. I come in from the meeting. It had snowed that Friday night. Snow was about that deep at uh, 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 James Grant's church over there in Archdale. Uh, Brother Bill Belcher was preaching revival meeting there. Honey, they were shouting it out. People showed up. This old boy with cowboy boots on ran around the church in the snow. I can't walk with cowboy boots on in wet grass, but he was running in the snow. I mean, God showed up in a great way. I was sitting over there in the corner like this. Miserable. I don't know why, but just out of the mercy of God, Brother Bill come over there, put his arm around me and said, Son, God want you to do something. And when he did, I just broke, you know. Went to the altar, knelt down and wept and wept and told God I'd do what he wanted to do. Right? Surrendered my life. Friday night, got up after the meeting, hallelujah, went to the house, walked in. I was crying. I was, <sighs> you ever get them snubs you'd cried so much? And I mean, just a holy ghost ringing, yeah. And I went in the house, and mom and dad's looking at me like that. And I said, I'm surrendered to call to preach. And they just looked at me like, what are you talking about? Dad was lost, didn't have no clue. He thought I was having a mental breakdown, and I was to a point. <laughs> Mom just looked at me, didn't understand. I get no support, zero, none. I love my parents. They're still alive. They, they saved serving God now. Best members I got. I'm serious. Work harder than anybody. Got up next morning, had to go to work. My cousin come by and picked me up, got in a truck with him. I was sitting over there. I was still crying. I was wallowing on the window. Alan's looking over at me. What's wrong with you? I answered a call to preach. God called me to preach. I said, I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach. Zero support. Zero. I lived, my company I worked for closed down. We moved down to Lawrenceville Winder area. Lived down there. Was a member at Crossroads. Isn't that ironic? I thought that's amazing. Well, the whole time I was down there, God opened up the door for us to move back to Greensboro come back up here, was going to pastor. I went in and told my boss, said, I've got to move back to Greensboro. I'm going to take the church. Had no support whatsoever. I mean, you know what, you've been there? You know what I'm talking about? And sometimes I've looked around, and, and when I thought, <laughs> shows you how naive I am, I thought I'd go back and I'd take the church, preacher, and I'd have a convertible, Corvette, 
That's what I'm dreaming. Have them club head covers hanging out the back. I'd be in the Baptist Preacher's Club every Monday. Preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, people throwing themselves on the altar getting saved. You know, I had no idea. And I said, this is going to be great. Thank God I have arrived. Got to church, not a preacher in Greensboro called me. I've never been invited to the clubhouse. I don't have a Corvette. I can't play golf. Ask him that. Nothing worked out like I thought it would. You preach and preach and preach, and hardly anybody ever gets saved anymore. And people in the church, like I told you, is dysfunction, wild, crazy, mean as hell itself. Why don't you quit? Because I just believe God. I just believe God's going to do something. I'm going to say something here. I'm making a mess out of this. God help me. But I told preacher yesterday, we're sitting there talking about riding motorcycles. We all three stopped at this little intersection. And I said, fellas, I said, God has something great for all three of us to do. Else we'd been dead a long time ago the way we ride. I just choose to believe the promise of God that God is going to do something great. And Joseph said, hey, I remember what God told me. I I remember what I dreamed about. I've been in the pit. I've been in prison. Everybody's left me. I'm down here by myself. But God, you're still around. I'm going to hang in there, God, and you're going to do something great for me. He chose to believe the promise of God. Why didn't he fail? Number two, he chose to see the purpose of God for his life. Now, this is hard. This is the hard part. This is the hard part. Joseph said, God, whatever you want to do to get me to where I need to be, do it. That's hard. That's hard. I do not enjoy tribulation. I do not enjoy suffering. I do not enjoy things when they go wrong. But I want to say this. If all we did was shout it out, What are you going to do when the storms hit? When they hit, I don't feel like shouting. Feelings betray you. Feelings will mess you up. Joseph said, God, wherever you want to take me to get me to where you want me to be, I'll do it. Prison? How do you say prison is the will of God? Now, I want to say something here. And I know you're independent, fundamental, bad. I want to say something here, and and I hope I, you get nervous, I hope I don't blow it here. But I'm sick and tired of hearing people say, God's in control, God's in control, God's in control. We've said that so much to where the lost world looks at when something happens, somebody has cancer, this, that, and the other, and they'll say this. Let me explain myself. Did God do that to you? I say, hey, time out. So, honey, don't blame God for stuff he didn't do. I understand God's permissive will. I understand the way the world... But I, listen, I'm not saying God said, boom, you got cancer. Here's what we need to do. Understand we're all living under the curse of sin. I'm saved, but I'm still touched by the curse of sin. And when things blow up and go wrong in your life, and they will, don't blame God... But get on your knees and ask him to be the God of the circumstance. God, I'm in the middle of this uh, for whatever reason. uh, And you know I'd be here, God. You knew that. You know I'm here now. And God, I invite you in to take this and control it. That's what Joseph did. I'm in prison. I'm in a pit. I'm in a mess. But God, you're still God. I, I know you said you'd never leave me, never forsake me. You take this and handle it. He believed in the purpose of God for his life. And he let God have it, and he didn't fail. I'm done with this. He chose, number three, to see past his bitterness to what God had already done and to what God was going to do. Genesis chapter 50, verse 18, his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, String up the ropes because I'm fixing to hang all these boys for what they've done to me. He yes, he could have, preacher. He really could have. Could. You guys are going to the pit. 
I'm going to throw you in there for a while. I'm going to sell you off. I'm going to put you in prison. You know? But Joseph looked at him and said, Fear not. Which implies to me he could see the fear in them on their face. They're trembling. He looked, he knew exactly what this feeling, because, you know, the old T-shirt says, been there, done that, fellas. I know how you feel. I remember how I felt when you threw me in the pit. I remember how I got that band of Midianites. I, I mean, I didn't know anything about them. They held me captive down here in Egypt, living down here. And I've never been, I've been here 10, 12, 15 years. I know how you feel. He looked at them and said, fear not. Isn't that incredible? Fear not, for I, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. God allowed this. I let him become the Lord of the situation, the circumstance. He used it. He's helped me. He's going to help all kind of people through what you guys thought was evil. But God did it. He knew his brother's heart. He knew they wanted him dead to begin with. They were jealous of the coat. They were jealous of his father's special love and attention. And when he had a chance to do what he could. Hey, verse 15 said, When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will pre-adventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil, the evil which we did unto him. They admitted it. What we done was evil. But Joseph looked at him and said, Fear not. I got two minutes. I'll say this. God meant it unto good. I wonder when we're going to get past, preacher, everything that's ever happened, everything that's ever done, everything that's been going on, that I never got my way. I didn't get this. I didn't get that. Boo-hoo this. They done me wrong. They done this. I'm going to tell you, that'll rob you from where God wants to take you and what he wants you to do. Let me, let me tell you why Joseph didn't fail. Because he chose not to. I'm not going to fail. God, what you've got for me, I don't always sing victory in Jesus. I don't sing amazing grace every day. I get up and pout and whine and boo-hoo with the rest of them. But somewhere along the line, thank God, the Lord gets to me and loves on me, and I says, you know, you're right, God, and I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Lord, I don't want to let you down. God, thank you for bringing me to Jubilee this week. God, rekindle my heart, stir me, help me. You know what? I'm on the firing line, God. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep on and keep on and keep on. Amen. 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 It is amazing when you travel. Just your brother Mark. It is amazing when you travel. How many bitter people you run into? You know? And uh, I'm not going to lie to you. That's one of the reasons brother Mark and I are so close. I like real people. You live in a world today of fake. You know, sometimes it's all right for people to look at you and say, you know what, I'm struggling with this deal. I don't quite understand it all. Um, I went through a year here at Calvary when we buried, well, one of them wasn't a member, but he was really a member. We went through a year and buried two kids, 16, 18. And I'll be honest with you, I'd pray for one of them, and I was completely sure God had healed that young man. I was assured of Miss Jennifer, God had healed him. I'd shout and took him to meetings with me. Some of you can get away, remember, that God had healed him. And I found out he was ate up with cancer like he was again. I went to bed one night and God, I'm telling you, the devil got all over me, buddy. He had a big mouth. Ours you, God. I ain't going to lie to you. I know people may feel more spiritual or whatever, but I went through a month or so there. I started questioning things that I've never questioned since I've been saved. I was passing one of the most exciting churches in Iredale County in America, as far as I'm concerned. And I started questioning. I don't get it. And I felt a little bit, Brother Kikendall, of bitterness starting to get there. And I chose to say, oh, no. You know what I learned? I should be in hell. Timmy Belcher should have been in hell. 
Adam Bradley should have been in hell. And the very fact that God would save all of us is more than we ever deserved. Thank you, preacher. Brother Mark, I love you. Thank you for just being you. As long as you you, you'll always be my friend. I mean that. I love you and appreciate you. I'm excited about this. Brother Catlin, will you come up and sing for me? Brother Jimmy's going to play. This is Brother Vance Catlin. He's going to sing for us. He's from Plant City, Florida. He's my daughter's adopted grandpa. He don't give her no money, though. But, uh, I want him to sing for us. Give it to her. Give it to her? Hallelujah. Praise God. This is a profitable meeting. Amen, Brother Kelly. Enjoy to have you with us. Pastors, Harmony Baptist Church, Plant City, Florida, near Tampa. I just preach to you for them every year. Love it. Love it. I call it and let me come back. I appreciate the uh, this thing on here. appreciate the letter that the, po or the uh, I guess the note that the student wrote to her uh, school to try to get out. That lets, that lets us know, let me know, that she's not ashamed. And may we never, ever be ashamed of what Jesus did for us. I'm not ashamed to stand and say I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say I'm trusting in His Word. I'm not ashamed to lift up high the blood-stained banner because I'm saved. I'm not ashamed. <clears throat> Sometimes we as Christians, we wait upon the shelf. We're ashamed to lift our hands in praise. We wait on someone else. But Jesus died at Calvary. God's plan he did fulfill. And that is why I stand today trying to do his will. I'm not ashamed to stand and say, I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say I'm trusting in His Word. I'm not ashamed to lift up high the blood-stained banner because I'm saved. I'm not ashamed.